So um, my area is really relating to genetics and epigenetics. And I think you've all heard, all, have all heard of the uh, DNA, which is the basis of our genetics. And this double helix with the genes is red, we call it expression, and it induces uh, cellular response, and that will induce then the phenotypes. That's why we select highly animals on uh, their genotype. However, for the last um, now maybe 20 years, and it's, uh, the uh, knowledge is rising about it, we know that the environment plays a role, quite an important role on the expression of these genes up to having a phenotype. And we call that epigenetics. That means above genetics. We can actually, through the environment, modify the expression of, this, of these genes and modify the phenotype. And one example is this cat. This cat was called Rainbow, and it's a total turtle uh, hair. And the total hair means it's a female. She has two X chromosomes. And um, bo both X chromosomes, normally in a female, only one X chromosome is expressed, is, is actually translated. But it's not the same in each cell. And each of these chromosomes had either the red, either the black. So this is a female. Only female can do that because they have XX. But their clone, carbon copy, doesn't have the same because all these, uh, only one X was expressed. So it's really to show you how with exactly the same gene you can have a very different phenotype. So my area of research is what is called the developmental origins of health and disease, where it's been shown in humans that modifications of the maternal environment, whether nutrition or obesity and lots of other things, but we won't go over about the other things, will lead to adaptations of the fetal environment with, again, these epigenetics. So what we call epigenetic marks will change how the genes are expressed in these fetus in adaptation to this environment. And the problem is that these adaptations that are made through the epigenetics will last and then will lead to things that will be seen in the offspring when they are adults. And in humans, it's, uh, it, it's part of the, the, the the reasons for the uh, epidemic of obesity, insulin resistance and diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Now we know that uh, it affects all types of animals uh, and uh, it can also affect reproduction, puberty and fertility, bone growth and health and behavior. And of course, this applies also to the horse. And when I, when I was first here with Peter Rosdale um, and we learned about that, and he told me, Pascal, if, it's, uh, if it affects the, the, the humans, it affects the horse, and that's been what I've been working on since uh, uh, I left Newmarket. So, as I told you, these epigenetic marks, um, they, ca they actually can go back and forth. However, um, they are really, the, there are windows of susceptibility to times when they are uh, put on the genes, and it's really in the early, life during pregnancy, also, but there's much less known during lactation, and probably the puberty is also a, a window of susceptibility. I've been working mainly during that time at the moment. So uh, we're really interested in the metabolism because we're interested in nutrition. And as you know, we have the equine metabolic syndrome. And in the equine metabolic syndrome, you have insulin resistance and prediabetes. Increased fat, inflammation also that will reduce uh, immune resistance, Cushing syndrome, laminitis, and osteochondrosis. And I've been really interested in what were the early um, uh, events leading to the onset of osteochondrosis and insulin resistance, which then can lead to diabetes. So what do we know if, if we're really wanting to know what are the early stages? Uh, we need to know how we feed our mares. So what do we know about feeding the brood mare? Well, first, there's no international system to evaluate the, how we feed our animals. Uh, you have the NRC system, which is uh, based on digestible energy. Then uh, some systems from Scandinavia and Germany based on metabolizable energy. And in France, we use a net energy system, and in, in Holland also. 
So sometimes it's very difficult to compare what you will apply with an RC or another system and what I will apply using another system. Um, the needs of the pregnant mares are based on aborted fetuses. And of course, aborted fetuses, you don't know if they had a normal growth. Um, and so um, there's an increase here of, the, of the, uh, here of the fetal weight. And there's different equations published by different researchers about what are the needs of the mares. So those are not really well known. There are old works, sometimes not in your breeds, sometimes in draft horses. Um, when we know in the woman, like in the horse, when, the, when there is a pregnancy, the metabolism changes and we uh, kind of adapt so that there's more glucose made available to the placenta and the fetus. And that is absolutely not taken into consideration in the recommendation that are given at the moment. And um, this is an example of one of our work where we used INRA uh, recommendations and um, we don't know which one is really, really good. He, here is the body condition score and we'll come back to the body condition score. You see that uh, when we are the optimal 3.5, that at uh, six months of gestation, when we fed 100% of energy recommendations, the body condition score went down and we had to feed up to 130% of the recommendations to keep the, the body condition. So um, we don't know um, what is really the right thing to do. And uh, at the moment, there's no uh, work apart from ours and maybe a few others on the effect of what we feed these mares on their offspring's health. So that really needs to be uh, qualitatively reevaluated. In practice, in the broodmare, uh, people follow the tradition. They feed scoops, not really based on the weight. 87 to 96% uh, of the breeders feed concentrates to their brood mares. And uh, they don't always evaluate body condition of their mares. And very often they overnourished, like what we see in my 130% group. Um, when we have studies on the general population coming from uh, France uh, and Holland, uh, and uh, I, don't know, I think it's Holland also, and Belgium, uh, they, they're, they show that when the mares and or the foals are fed with concentrates, there's an increase in, obes in osteochondrosis and, so, and, and in metabolic pathology. So we really wanted to reassess that, focusing on obesity and osteochondrosis. So the last thing is how do we evaluate a body condition score? Uh, in France, we use a scale from one to five. Uh, however, uh, in the United States and maybe in the UK also, you use the 1.9 uh, scale. And uh, obesity in the English scale is considered, uh, horses are considered obese above eight. And for us, uh, horses are considered obese at, at five and overweight at four. And uh, one thing about body con condition score, it's very diffic difficult to compare animals just based on one evaluation. What VCS is really useful for is to evaluate how your animals evolve through time. So I, I will uh, show you some of our experimental data uh, on the use of broodmare concentrates during pregnancy and the role of maternal obesity. So what did we know when we started? There were some works showing that uh, uh, diet rich in starch, so rich in concentrates, in, in uh, uh, cereals, uh, do have some effects on very early fall metabolism, changing the glucose metabolism. And there was already some work showing that uh, there were more osteochondrosis in the foals that were born to dams fed concentrates. There was also the work by Twink Allen where uh, they had, uh, he had mares, he was trying to look at nutrition and they had the strangles outbreak in the pregnant mares. So they lost a lot of weight and body condition and that led to the birth of lighter and shorter foals. So we know that nutrition is at least playing a role on, 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 the, on the birth weight of the foals. When we feed cereals, we may affect maternal metabolism. You know, it's as if people eat a lot of uh, carbohydrates and how it can affect the placental function. And then it can affect the full metabolism that's been shown, but uh, we have been looking at long-term effects and effects of other parameters. 
and it could affect osteochondrosis and uh, probably the postnatal environment plays a role too, but I won't have the time to dwell around that. This is the first experiment I want to talk to you about. Uh, about. I work with uh, warm blood mares. Uh, we don't have uh, thoroughbreds in our experimental herd. Uh, here we um, have, uh, the animals are bred by artificial insemination. We put them in the fields in pasture uh, in the summer. Then we put them in about six months of pregnancy. And this exper in this experiment, we had two groups of mares where one group was, was fed with barley, it was two kilos a day, plus hay, plus hay LH, and we reached 100%, 130% of INRA requirements. And the other group was only fed with hay and hay LH, uh, and of course uh, vitamins, uh, to 100% requirement. So this is the energy, proteins and fibers intakes in, in those animals. So in orange, you have the concentrate, in green, the forage. Of course, the forage had less energy, less proteins, but then they had more fibers. So um, we, what we saw is that the mares that were fed concentrates were more insulin resistant. Um, insulin resistance means that insulin, which is a hormone that uh, its role is to reduce glucose when we are uh, increased glucose after a meal, for instance, and when we are resistant to insulin, we take longer to take this glucose down. And that's really, uh, if you want, the pre-diabetic state. It's at the time you can still have a normal glycemia, but then if we look at insulinemia, you need more insulin to maintain this glycemia. So there's no clinical signs, but uh, it's just the way to diabetes. And here we look at the body condition score in our animals. So the concentrates, as I, you, I showed you earlier, they stayed high, whereas the forage went down. And they went pretty low to 2.5 as a mean. And as you see, uh, they took uh, about three months during lactation to go back up. And what's really funny, I, just before I gave this talk, I, I asked um, uh, Sue, who gave you the talk this morning about these feral horses, and that's exactly what she has in her feral horses. And you remember, they were 100% pregnant. So what did we have? We had no difference between the groups in the weight, the format of the foals, nor their placentas. Nothing to report. However, when we examined further those placentas, the one that were in the forage group that had less energy, we have an increase in the exchange capacity, the blood vessels in the placenta that will allow the exchange, in, those group, in this group, as if the placenta was adapting to get more energy from this mare that was less fed. And in the concentrate placenta, we had more inflammation, so um, something like, yeah, more, more inflammation. So it seems that there was some adaptation of the placenta to the maternal restriction to ensure fetal growth. This is the, so we do a complete panel for osteochondrosis uh, in those folds, and I just really summarized uh, the, the uh, data here. In black, you have the, one, the animals that are affected by osteochondrosis, and in, and in, in non-black, it's uh, just a group. So you see that in the concentrate group, we had 45% of the foals that had osteochondrosis, whereas only 17% in the forage group. In terms of fetal development, we saw no difference in, uh, with the sides, no body weight, absolutely no difference to see. Uh, however, we measured the cannon bone, and I don't know why we did that. We, we saw that in one paper, and we thought maybe it's an important thing, especially uh, for us uh, working on, on show jumpers. Uh, cannon bone uh, thickness can be important when they go down from the jump. And you see that the forage animal had a smaller cannon bone width. I don't, I, at the moment, we don't know really what it means in terms of, of, of uh, resistance. Uh, another thing that was interesting is that when we, uh, um, we, we all, always geld our animals at about one year of age, and the testicles of the forage males were much less mature than the testicles of the concentrate group, which could indicate that these forage animals will have a delay in puberty. We could not test uh, the effects on fertility because, of course, we had gelded them. 
um, after one year of age, these animals, the, the, you have the insulin sensitivity, so that's, uh, the, these guys are resistant, so the animals that were uh, fed forage had a bit, were a bit more resistant than the concentrate. And again, at one year of age, I'm, I'm just showing different uh, timings because, uh, of course, you have the effect of the fetal environment and the effect of lactation and then the effect of postnatal environment and osteochondrosis lesions can uh, evolve until 18 months of age. And uh, at one year of age, well, these animals were fed uh, optimally postnatally and we then had equal lesions in, in the two groups. So, in conclusion, when we fed cereals to mares, we, our mares became insulin resistant. We had placental inflammation and vascular alteration of the mares, and we had more osteochondrosis lesions in uh, the offspring, at least uh, in the young offspring. When we fed with more fibers, we had delayed testicular maturity, we had altered metabolism, and altered cross-sectional cross growth. So um, it really depends on what you want, whether you want to have more incidence of osteochondrosis or whether you're concerned about altered metabolism and delayed maturity. So then uh, we wanted to follow up because in, in, uh, in uh, warm bloods as well as in thoroughbreds, uh, they can be overfed for the sales. And so uh, unfortunately we didn't do it at the yearlings age, but at their second winter we overfed all the foals with 100 what 140% uh, energy uh, compared to requirement. We were tempted to uh, mimic the preparation for yearlings for auction. We are not exactly at the same timing. So what we found as a summary is that offspring from the barley group, from the uh, uh, concentrate group, were more affected by overnutrition challenge than the forage learning. Uh, yearling. So they became, they, they had more changes in, in their metabolism, which may then affect their performance or uh, predispose them to uh, diabetes or uh, EMS. However, the forage yearling, as I, I have shown you earlier, they already had an altered carbohydrate metabolism at 19 months of age, and maybe it's just because of that that they were not so much affected by overnutrition. So I'm afraid I'm not, I will not have a clear answer to those questions, but they, they need to be considered. So, uh, from what we saw, we still thought that it was better to feed mares with forage only if it was possible, because those carbohydrates really change the insulin metabolism, and there's more to osteochondrosis when the mares are supplemented. And uh, the small reduction in the body condition score did not affect uh, the fall growth, which was one of our concerns. But it could delay puberty, and uh, we haven't... Uh, um, uh, tested the effects on mares' fertility. However, uh, looking at uh, Sue uh, McDonnell's uh, work, uh, I don't think it has very much of an effect, but we haven't tested it. And the excess nutrition in the young horse affects their glucose metabolism, and we don't know if this would have long-term effects. The second model was, that we used is obesity. Uh, obesity is um, defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a, a risk for health. So um, it's, you know, a scale five on, on body condition score. But if you just take one measurement of one animal and it's five, that doesn't mean that this animal is obese. In fact, what you have is in normal animals, in the winter they will lose body condition then in the spring it will rise, and in the summer on lush pasture they can go to four or even a bit more, but then they will then go down again at the end of the summer to go up again uh, then, you know, uh, at the beginning of autumn and, and then come down again. Whereas the obese animals, they just stay all the time high. And that's really what you need to remember, and that's why I tell you about the BCS, one BCS measurement doesn't tell you anything. It's the series of BCS measurements that will tell you whether the animals are obese or not. And that's really one of the strong take-home messages that you need to keep. So overweight and obese horses do not lose body condition in winter. So um, there's a lot of work on obesity in horses. 
In the UK, 18 to 55 percent of horses are classified as overweight, and horse owners were shown to underestimate the body condition of their horses with no difference between professionals and non-professionals. And I can tell you that I see that all the time. And uh, I sent my daughter to uh, a vet for two weeks, one of the big clinics in, in the Paris area. And uh, after two weeks, she came back and she said, Mom, our, our horses are too uh, slim. And they were, so I had to go through every horse and go, you see, they are in good body condition. She just got used to see fat horses, and that, were, that became what she wanted to see. And so you have to be very careful about that. Um, when the BCS is measured by trained evaluators or veterinarians, you see the incidence is really uh, very, it changes a lot from 2 to 70%, 72% of overweight horses in Canada and USA. Of course, the ones that are really in training are around, around the 2%, and then the 72% concerns uh, horses that do nothing. Uh, 14 to 42% in Europe, 23% in Australia, and 47% in New Zealand. And between 1 and 19% of these horses are considered obese. So it's a very high incidence. What is important for uh, obesity? Genetics and the breed. I mean, it's easier to have an obese pony than to have an obese thoroughbred. Age, sed sedentary lifestyle, and overnutrition or malnutrition. It's ex exactly like humans. So what does obesity do to horses? Well, it induces insulin resistance, pre-diabetes. It, in, it induces a lot of fat tissue with uh, hormones that we're interested in that regulate, uh, regulate metabolism, which are leptin and adiponectin. It increases low-grade inflammation, which may reduce immune responses to infection. However, in terms of reproduction, so far, no report says that there's a problem with reproduction. They have, they have a tendency to have continuous reproductive activity, and there doesn't seem to be any effects on falling parameters. We are concerned about that because in women, obese women, it's a problem at parturition. However, there was no work on the, what effects it has on the offspring, and no effects on over, what, what it wasn't known about overnutrition during pregnancy. So um, we took our breed, our, our mares again, another year. And here we determined the year before which ones were obese and which ones were not. So we had 10 normal mares, uh, BCS of less than four at insemination. And the obese, uh, they were at more than uh, 4.25 at insemination. And we followed them until falling. Then we followed the falls until, until 18 months of age. And we looked at the effect of body condition, low-grade inflammation, and energy metabolism of these pregnant mares, and looked at the same in the foals, and also studied osteochondrosis. So what did we see in pregnant mares? So, um, sorry. Body con the con condition score in the obese is in red, and you see that the normal, they lose body, con body con condition score uh, during pregnancy and in early lactation. They had systemic inflammation. This is a proxy for uh, inflammation called SAA. And in early gestation, it was increased, and then it stabilized during gestation. Then um, obesity also can affect uh, uh, liver function um, because there's a decreased hepatic function in, in rats and pigs that are obese. And uh, we see uh, that the urea is just very transitly uh, lowered, but then afterwards there's no effects, so we, are, we felt a bit uh, happy about uh, the liver. Then we looked at the insulin sensitivity, and so I, I won't go into exactly what those means. Um, the insulin sensitivity was decreased in the obese, that means they were more resistant, but they were still managing to keep their glycemia, which means that they were really pre-diabetic. So these obese mares were pre-diabetic. And uh, despite, they kept the same glucose concentration. So if you just measure glucose, you won't see anything. You'll just say, oh, my mare is normal. You have to measure insulin to know. And then also they have disturbed uh, leptinemia and adiponemia, adiponectinemia. As, you, as I told you, those are related to the fat storage. So what did we see in falls? This is the growth of the falls, nothing. So that means if you just look at the falls, their weight, and you will not see anything. However, they had systemic inflammation increased, 
as false, and they were already insulin resistant at six months of age. Then at 12 months of age, when we put them on stable, and when they're on stable in my farm, they are on automatic distributor of, of, of uh, concentrates. That means they eat all day and not in meals, and that may play a role, and that's what we are going to test in the next experiments. Uh, so I can't tell you, so it might be an environmental effect that uh, it disappears at 12 months. And then when they are back after the winter, however, they still have this pre-diabetes uh, uh, profile. And in terms of osteochondrosis, we didn't see any difference uh, in the young ones. At 12 months of age, we saw more osteochondrosis. Remember, we are in small numbers in the offspring of the obese. And we still had more osteochondrosis at 18 months. However, here, that was not significant anymore. So we didn't see any uh, difference in fat storage and nor in testicular maturity in the offspring of the obese mares. So in conclusion for obesity, it induces in the fall, in the mare, insulin resistance, free diabetes, methanol inflammation, placental inflammation that I haven't shown you, we uh, saw chronic low-grade inflammation in the falls, signs of insulin resistance in the falls, and a bit more osteochondrosis lesions in the falls. And that goes through the placenta. We looked at the placenta, and when we looked at the function of the placenta, we saw that it, was the, it had the same disturbance as what had been described in the placenta of uh, diabetic women. So we can make a relation with uh, humans. So in conclusion, um, I don't think I'm going to tell you something very new, but uh, uh, we need to uh, feed, if we can, mares with forage only. And again, think of Sue McDonald's with a uh, foal. She said the, the, they were really losing a lot of body con condition uh, during the winter, and they're still uh, doing well. And if possible, limit concentrates because they are the one that's going to make uh, the um, insulin increase. We know that the limited body loss of body condition in pregnant mares is allowed. You don't have to worry about it. It's not going to affect the full growth, and, and it, they're going to do well. And probably I would advise very strongly to follow body conditions uh, score uh, using the table for body condition score, just not doing it by the eye, or weight the mares to try and avoid obesity and, uh, you know, not, not let these animals just stay uh, fat all the time. And with that, I want to thank uh, all the groups that have been working for me on, on this area. Thank you. <laughs>